Hello, everybody. Thank you very much for joining us and a very warm welcome to this British Coffee Association webinar on coffee and climate change, the future. This is the first in our In Conversation with series, and today we are delighted to be in conversation with Dr. Aaron Davis and Dr. Casper Chater, both of Royal Botanic Gardens Q. Um, guys, we are so grateful to you for agreeing to take part in this conversation today, especially since coming off the back of the COP26 Climate Summit. Climate change and sustainability are at the forefront of everyone's thoughts, individuals and industry alike, really. And obviously the research work that both of you are involved in focuses on crops and climate change resilience, sustainability and adaptation. So it's almost like we planned this. Um, welcome to everybody. There will be an opportunity to ask questions at the end, so please do. Um, you can type them in the comments or questions box there and we'll get round to asking those. We've got great attendance today from people who work in a variety of roles across the coffee industry. Um, a hugely significant industry, as we all know, according to research by the British Coffee Association, um, around two billion cups of coffee are consumed around the world every day. 100 million farmers are involved in growing coffee to supply that demand, and the global coffee market is valued in excess of 100 billion US dollars. But as we digest the details coming out of COP26 and the challenges involved in limiting global warming, we're asking today what the future holds for coffee in terms of production amid a warming planet. Coffee, of course, is a perennial crop. It's susceptible to the effects of climate change, namely drought and temperature changes. And Brazil is the world's leading exporter of coffee and produces almost 40% of the global supply. As we know already, production there has been hit particularly hard recently by frosts, by drought and leaf rust disease. So what are the options? How can coffee adapt? What are the risks and also the opportunities presented by climate change? Um, Dr. Anna Davis, who joins us as Senior Research Leader of Plant Resources and Head of Coffee Research at Royal Botanic Gardens Q. You've been investigating pathways, Aaron, um, for adaptation in regards to coffee crops. Tell us about those. Yeah, so you know, about, let's say about 10, 12 years ago, we wanted to really understand the risks uh, posed by climate change for coffee um, and perhaps the opportunities uh, as well. So we, we did that. We'd started working in uh, East Africa and um, we actually looked at um, the Ethiopian coffee sector and how that was being affected by climate change and what that would look like across this century. And then doing that work, uh, we sort of understood where the risks and opportunities would be. Um, and, then, and then the sort of focus was really on solutions. What would we do um, in Ethiopia and, and in other parts of the world where um, coffee production was part of their you know, their major economy. So essentially there are three pathways. We can adapt the farm, we change the microclimate by using irrigation, extra shade, mulching. Secondly, we can change the crop itself. Uh, that's either um, change the cultivar of coffee we use, say a different type of Arabica, or change the species, uh, say to Robusta, or look at something completely different, a new species, a new hybrid. Um, and then I guess the, the final phase in that stage is to actually say, look, um, we can't grow coffee anymore, let's switch to another crop. Uh, and then the third option is to move coffee or to move coffee production areas. So as the um, climate becomes unsuitable in some areas, but more suitable in others, uh, those areas will come into production uh, for some in some farming areas, and indeed we're we're seeing that in in East Africa and particularly in Ethiopia, where uh, people who've been growing coffee for many generations are no longer able to grow coffee in a profitable way, and farming areas that have almost never grown coffee um, suddenly find that there is suitability or increasing suitability, and are growing coffee for the first time. So, so there are new coffee areas opening up in Ethiopia, for example, um, and in places that are much higher in elevation than, than, than ever uh, 
um, before. So we always used to say 2,000 meters was the maximum elevation in Ethiopia, uh, and now it's it's up to 2,600 meters. So really quite a shift. And the feedback we are getting from farmers is that, um, and people on the ground, is that coffee is is on the move. The trouble with that option is there's land uh, use issues. That land is probably being used for some something else by somebody else, or there could be a nature reserve. And the thing you really want to avoid, of course, is moving people. You do not really want to see um, human migration uh, in, in any form, really, to, 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 to try and overcome this issue. But I, you know, from what we've seen so far of those three options, um, for many parts of the coffee producing world, the second option, that is change the crop, holds the most promise. Uh, and I think we're going to go into that in some detail this afternoon. I think we are. <laughs> we're going to talk to you about this. Um, it's a rediscovered species, uh, really, isn't it? As opposed to a new one, it's a coffee stenophylla, if I said that right. Uh, that was um, on the go a long time ago, so it's it's a sort of rediscovered species of, of coffee as opposed to a new one, isn't it? And that's that's what some of your research work's been focusing on recently. Yeah, that's right. So what we're what we're saying is that we're we we're not going to lose Arabica and Robusta um unless something drastic, really drastic happens. Uh, they'll always be with us, but for some farmers there will have to be other uh, coffee crops, uh, much more resilient crop, coffee crops. And if you went back from now, say 100, 150 years ago, ago, we were actually growing a greater diversity of crops, including um, species like Stenophylla and Liberica. Now, Stenophylla is an interesting uh, little coffee because um, it was, as you say, cultivated at scale in Upper West Africa up until around the 1900s, maybe 1910, and by the 1920s, it had pretty much disappeared. Uh, it's interesting uh, for most people because all the historical accounts of the species say that it has a fantastic taste and one in particular saying that it tastes better than Arabica, which is, of course, is <laughs> always exciting. Um, I mean, you know, for many years we wanted to do more work on this species and, and sort of assess its potential, but we just couldn't find it not in the, in the quantities that, that were required to really evaluate it properly. Um, so the idea is, was that we would go to Sierra Leone where it was once cultivated uh, in some quantity. In fact, it was exported to Europe, uh, but we couldn't find it. Uh, there was, uh, it just wasn't available on farms, etc. cetera. Um, agronomists didn't know anything about it. So what we had to do was go back to the places it was found in the wild and reintroduce it from the wild. Uh, it was last seen in Sierra Leone in 1954 um, and we, we did find it but after some considerable effort. Uh, it's it's a rare threatened species, it's really quite rare in the wild now. So it's it's now, this was in, at the end of 2018 and it's now been propagated uh, successfully um, and has just started to be planted out in Sierra Leone. So the interesting thing, you know, apart, one of the things that we really wanted to verify when we sort of refound this in Sierra Leone was that, it, that of course, the flavour. We wanted to understand or, or confirm that those sort of very old, over 100 years old, historical reports that it had a good flavour. And um, I, in the end, we had several panels, I think, nine panels and they all agreed that it was commercial and it did you know, 80 percent of the judges I and mean, it was a blind assessment said that it tasted like arabica coffee it's not quite the same it's got some some different flavor uh, attributes and notes but um when we first tasted it in london we thought it was a um very much like a rwandan uh bourbon arabica that's how specific it was, you know, in terms of being like, but being like Arabica. So yeah, really interesting. And then we published a paper earlier this year, which shows that although it tastes like Arabica, it's from a completely different environment, a much, much hotter, um, partially seasonal environment. 
and in fact its annual mean temperature uh, requirement is 6.2 to 6.8 degrees Celsius greater than Arabica. So really, it really does grow in hotter places. And that's uh, that was a great surprise to all of us to have that Arabica flavor profile in places where you would grow Robusta. So it has two very um, important attributes um, that we that we know of. And the early uh, reports also say that it uh, has some resistance to coffee leaf rust. So that's really that could be really exciting as well. Yeah, absolutely. As we know, that's something that's um, damaged a lot of the, the crop in Brazil um, of late. And that's actually somewhere that I'd like to, to bring you into this as well, Casper, in terms of um, disease that affects coffee plants and um, leaf rust being one of them. And in your line of, of research, you, you work within um, the, the gene editing uh, phase of this. So how, how could gene editing potentially work with respect or regard to coffee and potentially adjusting that so that it would become more resilient to, to disease like that? So gene editing is a, is a name for a kind of suite of, of different uh, tools, um, usually using what are called nucleases, which are a type of protein uh, that with a guide RNA, um, you can target specific uh, genes or specific uh, codes in the DNA of the plant to then change the sequence of that DNA. So it's a very, um, very precise way of making those changes that you would normally make through uh, a less or non-targeted um, breeding program. So normally a, a breeder would identify uh, a trait that they are interested in, for example, uh, disease resistance um, or, or some other stress resistance, or of course yield. Um, and they would then look at a population of, of maybe elite uh, lines, coffee lines in this example, and the breeder would uh, select for that trait and improve upon it based on the the pool of genes available in that population. But in, in gene editing, what you have is a tool to identify a gene. And for coffee, we, we already have a genomic level. So we know the coffee genome uh, of, of several different uh, coffees. Uh, and using that information, we can then target specific genes uh, to change them how we see fit. Uh, for example, if we see that particular coffee varieties are susceptible uh, to a particular disease, uh, we can identify through uh, population genomics and other, other kind of statistical uh, approaches uh, the cause of that uh, weakness or, or the opposite, the cause of the strength um, in, in that trait. And so you you know the gene, you know therefore the target, and you can change that gene using gene editing uh, to introduce the, the trait of interest. That's that's uh, more or less how you'd go about it. Easy, sounds so easy. <laughs> In terms of actually getting the, the the plant, then if you if you have edited it, obviously forgive my lack of scientific language, but if you sort of switch off, you know this. Uh, genome or, or part of the, the plant's DNA that's susceptible to whether it's uh, drought or, or temperature or coffee leaf rust, for example. How then do you, what is the process for then propagating that? How, how is that done in layman's terms? Sure. Well, it very much depends on the material you start with. I mean, just like uh, any going back to traditional breeding, if you put rubbish in, you're going to get rubbish out. But if you start with an elite line, a coffee that has got excellent flavor profile and other other properties then the, the gene edited coffee that you get from that will be more or less fit for for market assuming it passes all other uh, regulatory processes um, similarly if if you if you target genes that may have knock-on effects 
in other processes. So, for example, if you target this gene for rust resistance, maybe it has negative effects on yield. Well, you don't want that. So, it's not fit for market, but you have starting material for the breeder to then introduce that trait into better uh, varieties. So, it, it's, it's kind of a balancing act in that case. And then if we're talking, I suppose we're talking about two different things here, the way that, that sort of new technologies like gene editing can can do that, or, or also, Aaron, with your um, rediscovered species, and you're saying that that's stenophile has been propagated and, and sort of grown at the moment. How long then for both of those instances for the, the product to come to market? You know, I take it it's a really lengthy process. Yeah, I do want to start with the traditional approach, <laughs> which is, you know, uh, uh, coffees are coffees are slightly different to many other crop plants in this, in that it's not truly domesticated. Uh, I mean, it has been sort of slightly domesticated, of course, because cultivars have been selected and hybrids have been produced, but not so much as other plants. And in fact, you can take wild robusta and wild arabica. Uh, as long as you do a, a nice selection, grow it up, and you've got uh, essentially a, uh, a crop plant, uh, and you can't do that with many other crops. So, um, for something like Stenophylla, you're restricted by the time that it takes for the seed to grow and the plant to produce coffee beans, which we think is going to be about at least four years, um, maybe seven years. But um, it, you know, it depends on a number of factors. But it could happen quite quickly um but what we are trying to do with stenophylla is that to get a crop ready as soon as possible but uh in during that process of bulking up stenophylla is to find the best variants we can so it's sort of like selection a selection process so we're, we're taking stenophyllas from different places and if we see one that has higher productivity a better taste um, more disease resistance or a combination of those characters, um, that's the one you would want to ideally bulk up, propagate and, you know, uh, essentially um, domesticate. Uh, and that could take a bit longer. So we might see some initial stenophylla production within, say, four to seven years, but it might be 10 years, 15, 20 years before we get an improved um, stenophylla that's um, more suitable for you know and more profitable for farmers but we just don't you know it's it, it's it, we just don't know at this moment um what that process or, or how successful that process will be and what would you say in terms of of the approach that that your um focus and research takes casper similar period of time or it's so gene editing is a is a a pretty new technology and the end product of gene editing is something that in theory could be obtained through uh, traditional breeding techniques but in theory gene editing is, is a much faster cleaner more direct approach so in that sense it's quicker than normal traditional breeding methodologies but the caveat is that you have to get into gene editing through GM, through genetic modification. And that's the major stumbling block for uh, regulatory reasons and the traditional public backlash that occurred over the last 20 or more years around uh, genetic engineering. And I know that um, coffee producers uh, have been interested in, in genetic engineering of coffee for a long time, uh, both in the US, such as in Hawaii, um, in Mexico, Brazil, um, and only recently has that been readdressed because there was such an outcry over this, me this method. Um, and unfortunately, uh, there's a, a strong brand associated with you know, non-GMO products. And even though the end product of in editing is non-GMO, the process to produce it is not. 
So this is a, a real grey area and one that's being looked at actively by um, governments and, and uh, regulators in Europe and, and the UK and elsewhere. But in answer to your question, uh, you have to do the GMO part, which involves very careful tissue culture. So Aaron mentioned the uh, germination of the seeds and growth of, into adult plants. Well, in, in gene editing, you, you're, you're using what's called tissue culture, where you start from single cell and callus and work on that kind of material. So there's, there's that element of it. And then there's the selection of your uh, individual plants of interest that carry the gene edits you're interested in, and then uh, trying to understand how that uh, change has affected the plant. So it's it's a lengthy process. Um, you can't get away from that. And it's all the more complicated by the type of plant you're trying to modify, trying to change. So because you've got a woody tissue plant, they're quite resistant to uh, gene ed editing. I mean, trees are more difficult than uh, a, a a very base, a very, very simple crop plant. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And so you're talking a bit about um, sort of public skepticism there against um, gene edited plants, and and Aaron, you mentioned about the species that you've been looking into, Stenophylla. There's some. What, there's 130 coffee species, is that right? And we drink two pretty much, Arabica and Robusta. What's the if known, what are the coffee companies or how do they respond to this idea of di the divergence away from Arabica and Robusta? Is that yeah. proven to be? Yeah, that's a good question. I, I just wanted to sort of um, conclude the sort of uh, piece on sort of the time scales in, in, involved. And I think what we're doing with Stenophyla is just working on the species itself. But if I think in terms of a, a, a real commodity crop, it would involve some form of hybridization or gene editing or something. So um, it could take 30 years, you know, if, you, if you're really going for that, the next Robusta or the next Arabica. I think the key thing is in terms of climate change, which is what we're discussing here, in, in Arabica and Robusta, what we're seeing is that um, they don't really have the potential on their own to really adapt to the changes of the climate that we're going we're going to see over the course of the next several decades, um, or you know even in the next three or four decades, and that's why we need to look outside uh, Arabica and and Robusta. So yeah, you know, and we need to do that work now because we we need. Well, I keep saying this: we need incremental change. We need really robust new coffees. Um, and we, we we haven't got time for incremental changes like you know small small step changes. Uh, it's got to be really something really robust. Um, so, but to get to your your question, um, I think uh, you know going back, let's go back say ten years when I was talking about this at coffee meetings. Um, uh, I think a lot of um, people in the sector thought it was a bit crazy, and I even heard the word science fiction a couple of times. I think 10 years on, I, 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 I'm I much more confident that this approach is is one of the, you know, the, the pathways that we should be taking. And, you know, we, we're already working with some of the large uh, coffee buyers, you know, some of the world's largest coffee companies, and they're, they're, they're behind this. Uh, you know, you're not, they're not investing as they would in Arabica and Robusta, but I think, I think it's, it started. And, what I think we're also well, we, what we are seeing is it, it's at both ends of the value chain. So there's huge amount of interest, uh, for example, from baristas. I think the Australian barista champion got to the semi-finals not using Arabica robusta, but Eugenioides and Liberica. Um, you know, and it, that's high-level competition, of course. But what we're also seeing is farmers taking up Liberica in preference. To robusta, not only in places like Uganda, but also in South Sudan. So the kind of it's already started, I would say. 
and if you look at the the yield potential and uh, agricultural properties of species like Liberica, although they didn't work well in the past, now what we're seeing is uh, there are good tasting variants, and there is a there is an increasing demand for Liberica. So we'll it's probably we'll see Liberica come become more into the more sort of commodity level before um, other species. But as, as you say, there are 130 species. We've, we're trying to test them uh, one by one, but um, there's still lots of there's still lots of things we don't know about the wild species. So it's very exciting. Coffee to be drunk. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what would you say? What are the most important aspects to ensure sustainability then under climate change? Obviously, we're talking here about diversification of of species. What other things can, can be done um, in terms of sort of the coffee sector and a, a potential strategy going forward there to mitigate or adapt? Yeah, I, I think that's really interesting and, and, and uh, absolutely the most important question is um, at the moment. And so the work that Casper and I do is on the adaptation side. Um, what we really need to be focusing on and what we do a bit of work on is the mitigation. So we really we really need to aim for net zero by 2050 or or really before 2050. Um, if you look at the way temperatures have accelerated globally um, oh, since say the 60s or the 80s, um, it's 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 frightening. You know, in, in East Africa we're seeing 0.3 of a degree Celsius every decade. And and although the global average is one is 0.18 um, in many of the coffee areas is higher it's not even all over the world so we will breach 1.5 and possibly even two degrees by 2050 2060 if we do nothing so we we, we you know that's what cop, cops all been about of course uh, it's keeping warming under 1.5 um, uh, if not 1.5 somewhere close to 1.5 and if we don't do that then the work that Casper and I do will be largely irrelevant because you know once we get beyond two degrees, uh, I think the coffee, well the coffee sector will be in uh, crisis in terms of production. Yeah, and uh, Casper, obviously alongside rising temperatures, drought is a key marker of climate change, and and your research focuses on improving drought resilience in crops. And uh, can you talk to us about that in the context of coffee crops? Sure. So the long-term or even short-term uh, climate change forecasts, predictions are that where there are areas of traditional drought, um, drought-prone areas are only going to get worse. So, so what that means for a lot of coffee-producing areas and areas in the tropics is that we're going to have much more erratic um, weather. So there'll be not only much more frequent and perhaps more, well, definitely more pronounced droughts. You'll also have um, ex other extreme events such as flooding um, and, and storms. So it's, it's, it's a whole mixed bag um, that, and it's that unpredictability it's going to impact most on 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 farmers. So so you can't really um, if you want to plan ahead, you you don't know what to do in that case. And for for a, for a crop producer and for a farmer, that's that means serious problems uh, to to feed their family and make money. Um, so if if we can target just a few of these traits, as you say, uh, drought or water deficit resilience, um, flooding tolerance, there's all sorts of uh, things that need to be looked at if we, if we want to Im improve and maintain coffee production in, in these same areas. And obviously a, a huge part of the whole industry is to protect the, the, the farmers that are growing the crop but also pr protecting the land and we've seen a bit about deforestation obviously that was one of the big announcements that came out of COP on, on day two of the summit. How, 
How can coffee, um, what part does coffee play, would you say, in deforestation? Um, are there particular countries or areas that are already affected and, and how can we sort of mitigate that going forward? Yeah, I, you know, coffee grows in the tropical belt. Uh, the tropical belt is mainly covered by forest. Uh, and coffee has been a major cause of deforestation. There's no doubt about that. And that's, that goes back centuries, of course. Um, and it's still a cause of deforest, major deforestation, uh, particularly in South America. The, the crazy thing is, uh, you know, I, I think it's largely avoidable. Um, it, it requires some, some work and some effort, but there's no point in planting millions of trees if we're <laughs> cutting down primary rainforest. Um, and then putting that carbon into the into the atmosphere, I mean that's just simply crazy. So one of the things we really have to do is uh, uh, halt or reverse deforestation. Uh, abs uh, that's absolutely clear. And the, the the paradox, of course, is that coffee can be a cause of um, deforestation, a biodiversity loss. But on the other hand, it can be a cause, it can be an agent of biodiversity preservation and forest preservation. So if you look at um, coffee producing countries like Ethiopia, wh where coffee is produced in a, in a forestry system or an agroforestry system, um, the, the benefits of those producing systems to the, to the, to the environment, to the planet, to, to local stakeholders and communities is uh, vastly different to those of a, a, a high input, um, high intensity system where you're growing coffee without any shade or very little shade. And I think that's one of the the issues uh, in terms of the consumer, uh, the very end of the value chain, because although we have many different types of certification, they have no way of really knowing whether their purchasing choices are uh, uh, you know, doing uh, uh, a good thing or a bad thing. And I think that really has to change, and it and, I, and it will change because legislation is already up and running uh, to make sure that the value chain is uh, free of deforestation for commodity crops like cocoa, coffee, cotton, etc. So it is happening. Um, but for me, it's you know, compared to decarbonisation, it, it's an easy win, relatively easy win. And of course, you know, as we deforest, as we lose biodiversity, we lose options for adaptation. So Stenophylla coffee, for example, is a is an endangered species in the wild. And I, you know, I've said this a few times. If we, I think, if we were looking for it in ten years' time, due to deforestation, it probably wouldn't be there. And in losing that, we lose an option. And that's the same, you know, for many many crops. Um, you know. That's where our raw materials come from for producing the next generation uh, crops, crop species. What are your views on the, the mitigation measures that, that industry has brought in to address deforestation? Because there, there, are, there are some companies who are uh, looking at reforestation. The British Coffee Association's um, sustainability group recently made a position paper on deforestation and some of our members have given us some um, uh, examples of where they have been involved directly in reforestation and um, and, and other mes measures to sort of mitigate um, yeah. against deforestation. Is that going far enough or what, what more can, can they do? Look, I think it's a huge uh, reason to be optimistic and we're, you know, compared to even five years ago, uh, the, the focus on tree planting, the focus on forest preservation uh, is very, very strong. I mean, we've never seen anything like this before. I mean, the pledges for in terms of replanting trees or, or planting trees in new places is, is um, overwhelming. It's incredible. Uh, what I would say is focus on preserving what we have to begin with, you know, because it's not just the trees that are important. It's the carbon in the soil. You know, it's the carbon in the food, the food chain, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, you know, um, let's preserve what we've got because you don't produce a rainforest or a biodiverse um, environment by, by planting trees. That takes centuries. So let's look after what we've got first. Um, 
but yeah, I mean, it's it's a cause for uh, for for optimism. Uh, the fact that so much is being done, including you know, the coffee sector, is 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 probably ahead of many part many other food sectors in terms of looking at uh, you know and engaging in tree planting. It's not easy. It's not an easy thing to do. Um, you know, that you have to find some way to plant all these trees, um, and that that's not as simple as it as it seems. Because even though it looks like unoccupied unuseful land uh it's probably not it's probably deforested or it's probably a grassland for some reason probably pastoralism uh, raising cattle so yeah it's 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 tricky and there are other ways um in terms of using technology as well to kind of mitigate against deforestation or you, you've been involved in some uh, mapping some areas where uh where it's happening or where they can reuse other areas of land is that right so we're able to using uh high resolution satellite imagery um i images from space and remote sensing technologies we're able to tell intervention agents where to plant trees not only in terms of of environmental suitability but in the in the case of coffee where there would be a return on that planting investment and uh, where that would work in terms of climate security. So based on the climate change predictions, you know, you'd have to make sure that that investment has some return uh, for, for, for stakeholders. So yeah, it's, it's about planting the right tree in the right place at the right time for the right, right reasons. So there's a lot of work behind that. And both Casper and I are working on projects where we're using a, a, a range of new uh, methodologies and technologies to to make sure we have the uh, wherewithal to enforce legislation. So I'm working a bit on coffee, but Casper's working on soy. So the idea is that the products that that reach our supermarkets are deforestation free. I think that's that's really important. Mm -hmm. And Casper, obviously, we had um, an announcement by the UK government. Um, last month about the sort of relaxation in the rules around gene editing to allow for a bit more research here is that right how, how would that or could that impact on coffee specifically so the the relaxation around or the the what what the government is is doing is readdressing those um rules so i don't think that the the end result is, is definitely going to be a relaxation of the rules, but it's looking at re reappraising um, what it means, what these new technologies mean uh, to uh, current legislation, how we should move forward now that uh, the UK is no longer part of the European Union's uh, framework. So in terms of coffee, this will have impacts on the market and on coffee importation if indeed gene edited coffee products uh, come to market over the next few years um, and it might mean that it's easier for those uh, products to get to the consumer um, it also means that researchers research and development of new coffee varieties by UK based or UK interest um, companies uh, can go ahead. You know, there's if, if something is regulated against, you're much less likely to look into it as a as a potential option for um, solving a problem. So I think it's a really good thing that that there's this potential for relaxing the rules. Um, and you know, without without looking into uh, gene editing as an option we won't be able to know uh, how far we can go and, and the, the benefits that, that, that it could bring i mean it's it's a very very as i say it's a very very clean way of doing something uh, very targeted for for potentially really powerful um, benefits for not only uh, the farmer uh, but also for the consumer um, there are many things such as uh, caffeine levels in in the coffee or, or 
perhaps perhaps flavor profiles that gene editing could also address. So it's not, uh, I guess it's it's an endless list of, of possibilities. I would say. And, um, uh, sorry, are you going? Sorry, I, I just just sorry to, to interrupt, but I I I, I think Casper can can maybe um, embellish or, or or verify this, but so the, the the products of gene editing are not different from the products of traditional plant breeding. Casp uh, may have a, <laughs> a slightly different opinion on that or will be able to provide more information. And I think the other thing is that um, traditional approaches and gene editing approaches could be combined. You know, it's not, there's no ex exclusiveness about this. It's about getting to the right point in time uh, to get the right product to, to farmers, to producers. Casper, would you? Yeah. Completely. I mean, okay. you, there's a gene edited plant, assuming that it's been through all the steps to remove the um, the transgenic aspects of that process is just the regular crop. Yeah. And we, you know, we, 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 when we look at things like chemistry and flavor profiles, uh, dealing with, you know, changing uh cut profiles is is quite difficult with plant breeding um you know it's quite a lot of effort so uh, you know if you have a particular compound which is causing a, a really uh, unwanted uh, element to the sensory profile if you could get so far and then knock that out with gene editing um you might get to where you where you want to get Looking at um, the the coffee rust again specifically, Casper, is that potentially a disease for which gene editing could be an answer, either partially or or fully? Yeah, and I think there's this is an active area of research. Um, I think I believe it's investigators in France and in Brazil who are looking into uh, gene editing as a solution against coffee rust. And I know also that. Uh, researchers in Mexico are um, targeting uh, coffee borer, the the beetle, is it, um, to to make it uh, resistant, make the plant resistant to to uh, that pest. Um, so yeah, there are various groups around the world um, using these technologies already to to tackle these problems. Do you think the coffee industry, um, this is a question for both of you, um, what could they look to do pre-competitively then and as a priority action sort of going forward to continue production but also to obviously protect the farmers, the climate, the, the land? That's quite a big question, I appreciate no, I, that. <laughs> I, I think the problem at the moment um, is that there are so many voices in, in this area and some of them are aligned and some of them are contradictory and I think it's it's very difficult you know if, if you're sitting in a uh, you know any part of the value chain but particularly you know if you're a buyer um, a major player to, to, to really dig in deep and find out what the truth is or what where you really want to focus your resources and I don't think we've had an open forum for doing this um, you know I think we need a really you know, almost like a cop for, <laughs> for coffee where we thrash out you know exactly what we need to do within the framework of climate change because that's the that's the game changer isn't it uh, if it wasn't for climate change um there's plenty of other sustainability issues to deal with but climate change is so all-encompassing uh that 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 would be the focus but i think we need to have some consensus and a real um you know a, a, a uh, an agreed pathway of what we should do and it, I, I guess it's like the COP but it's also like the intergovernmental panel for climate change you know make it evidence-based you know it's not just about the people with the loudest voice it's let's look at the evidence and let's agree on the evidence and then um, devise a pathway that's going to be meaningful in terms of projected climate change because what I see in coffee and other crops is a lot of work um, that um, is progressing 
you know, climate resilience forward, but not at the speed that it needs to move to keep up with accelerated climate change. And I've, you know, mentioned some of the, 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 the um, figures around um, decadal changes in temperature. And, you know, it's, it's not called accelerated climate change for nothing. You know, we really need to get our skates on. So you would propose a, let's call it a cup of coffee. Uh, <laughs> and uh, Casper, what would, what would your uh, answer to that question be? What we can do or what the, the industry could do sort of pre-competitively going forward? I mean, the industry is, is that kind of the, the it's restricted by what the consumers are willing to have as well as what the the con the countries the legislation is is um allowing them to do uh, but where i think the research element comes into play is that what researchers can do is produce is create these uh, varieties and test them uh, in the field and you know the, the it, what the proof and the proof of the pudding is that, that you've got farmers that if you've got a product you've got a crop that will answer a problem they're going to grow it if the if the coffee either doesn't grow well doesn't sell well they're not going to grow it so so really it's about having the the, the raw materials i.e the plants that resist this uh, stress or resist this pathogen or insect or whatnot and you know testing that i think that that's where we can really make a big difference and with that starting material um you know it's up it's up to the governments and the consumers to get, then catch up and unfortunately as as Aaron said there's a lot of misinformation and people are scared of of gmos even gene editing um because they've had this message from other players uh that there's something to be afraid of and there isn't <laughs> i mean there's something to be aware of but like just like any other um plant uh crop uh species that that you investigate um whether that's a new food that comes onto the market it doesn't matter its origin it's always going down a regulatory process for for consumer and environmental health that has to be a given um but but actually the technologies per se there's nothing nothing to be afraid of well, I think we'll open uh, some questions because I'm aware that we're almost at five to four now. That's really flowed in this time. Um, I wondered if anyone has any questions that we'd like to put. We've got one in actually from uh, Christine at Sukafina um, that I'll put to you both. And it's this idea of when we're talking about future proofing the coffee industry, how do you both see the role of sort of alternative coffees, you know, molecular coffee? Um, or cellular coffee, she says, or compound coffee, which sustainably grown microbes. Is there a role for this? Or what so, is this role? Yeah, so we're, there has been a few uh, beanless coffees produced over the last few years. Um, the first one to really come to the fore was based on um, reinventing coffee from scratch, i.e. getting a sort of a carrier substance and then adding the major flavor compounds. So it's a completely sort of synthetic coffee made from plant-based products. Uh, and it doesn't, there's nothing that's not involved with a, with a coffee bean at all. Um, and then there's what we call um, cellular agriculture. So you take a cell of coffee and you bulk it up in a laboratory like uh, in vitro like on a petri dish but on a massive scale in a bioreactor so it is actually coffee um and then it's manipulated in a number of ways made into a powder and roasted um and there's there's also i i don't know much about this i haven't heard much about this microbial microbial coffee or fungal coffee uh, where you're growing bacteria or fungi to produce 
a substance that's then treated in some way and made into a coffee. So they're all synthetic coffees. Um, and the idea, I guess the main marketing thrust behind these coffees is that they're deforestation free, uh, use very little water, um, require very little in terms of um, fossil fuel inputs or fertilizers, et cetera, et cetera. And we know that agriculture is a major cause of um, a producer of greenhouse gases, particularly livestock production. Um, but I think it's really early days on this because I, I don't see the, again, I don't see the science behind some of those claims. Um, I'd like to see more transparency on exactly what the inputs are, what the carbon usage might be. Um, and, you know, trying to find out what they actually taste like <laughs> is incredibly, you know, we're not seeing any online reviews, et cetera. Um, I think, I guess the key, key questions are, what does that do to the, to the, you know, to the sector that we already have. Um, you know, do we want to be producing all our coffee in bioreactors and laboratories? I think the answer is absolutely not. Um, what happens to those 100 million people in the coffee farming uh, sector alone? What happens to them? What are the environmental implications of doing that? And I think they're, they're probably extremely negative. Uh, so I think there's all sorts of things to take into consideration. Um, I don't think that's going to be the case. I don't. I always think it's going to be a niche product. I think people will always want the the whole food, the the, the, the bean. Um, and I, you know, you it's you can't really recreate coffee. It's not just about a few key compounds. There are lots of other things, uh, you know, that go into the, the cup. Um, the number of compounds, the sucrose, all the other elements to it. And there's also, you know, we drink coffee because we, we like the variety. Um, you know, would we want to be drinking a coffee that always tastes the same? And again, I think the answer is the answer's probably no. I do think it has a, a place, but I don't think that space is going to be a big sector of the, of, of the, um, the, the coffee world. Um, well, Christine's very happy to hear that answer, she says, so oh, thank you very okay. much for that. Um, Aaron, I'll put the, uh, Casper, I'll put this uh, other question to you rather than have you answer your, um, the same one there because we're running out of time. Um, but as um, Liam has been in touch saying, as an independent coffee roaster, it's easy to feel helpless with regards to climate change's effects on coffee. We can work towards carbon um, neutral negative as a company, but what else would you recommend we do? What are the other options available? Hmm. Um, <laughs> I mean, I, I, as an independent coffee roaster, I would I would suggest um, main, you know, ensuring that you're you're buying from people that are actively engaged in habitat restoration or maintaining um, their area in a, in a kind of climate positive way. Um, it's, I think it's really key to have those kind of stories, not just for uh, your own ethical stance, but also for the consumer. And there's a lot of interest from consumers to know where their coffee's from and how that coffee uh, fits in to the local economy and, and local ecology. Um, so I think I think that's a powerful message to, to, to put across. Okay, and I yeah, I would agree. Try and quickly squeeze one last question in. Um, it's from Malcolm at UCC Coffee, and he says, regarding the cop of coffee idea, we've got hmm. patent on that, by the way. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> as an industry with profit motivation, how might the panel suggest a strong outcome could be achieved? Are there precedents in other fields? Yeah, look, it has to work. All this has to work right the way across the value chain. Um, you know, whether it's new plants or, or, or biodiversity conservation, it has to work across the value chain. Um, and you know, I I've, I've been involved in projects where we have uh, had uh, outcomes that are extremely beneficial in terms of the environment and forest conservation and for farmer income. Um, so I, it's possible. I just think we need to really work 
towards that goal. I think there is enough margin in the value chain to to achieve all those things. Um, maybe we'll be paying a little bit more for our coffee, um, but I, you know, I, I really think it's something that's achievable, and ha we have to do it. You know, it's not you know, uh, biodiversity preservation and and carbon. Uh, a reduction in greenhouse gas emissions is not something we'd like to do or we feel we're obliged to do. We, we, we have to do it. If we don't do it, there won't be any industry. <laughs> be, you know, we're talking about uh, our survival here. So, we, you know, we have to do it. Asper, a last thought from you on our final question. Sorry, I, I didn't hear you there. Uh, sorry, I was saying a final thought from you on our last question. Can we... Um, how might the panel suggest a strong outcome could be achieved if we have a sort of a uh, cop for coffee, as it were? Yeah, I, I echo Aaron's points completely. Um, it's you know, obviously there's there's competition in coffee. I mean, people are working in the same in the same area, um, but it has to be a kind of unified front against against these uh, climate forces and there, there needs to be an overall you know, overarching strategy to to defend the industry against it. I think we could maybe um, get this cup of coffee idea off the ground and get Malcolm along on the panel as well with you too. That seems like a good place to wrap it up because we are out of time. Um, so thank you so much. Um, thanks to Liam and Christine and Malcolm for the, for the questions and to Paul as well. And um, a huge thank you to Dr. Aaron Davis and Dr. Casper Chater um, from Royal Botanic Gardens Q for coming along today and um, sharing your expertise and your insight. It's been really um, useful and, and um, hopefully everyone's enjoyed it. Thank you so much for your time and we'll send out um, a questionnaire later um, for some feedback on it and um, I'm sure this will be made available as well for um, people to, to, to look at later if they missed it. So thank you very much everybody for joining us. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you Katrina. Thanks. Thanks everybody. Cheers.